After the very academical videos about the functionality and the properties of semiconductor devices, we will now start to create some practical circuits. Amplifying circuits will be built and examined by using bipolar junction transistors. The curve progression shown here was recorded at the video about the electrical properties of bipolar junction transistors. As you can see, the resistance of the emitter-collector line drops from approximately 20 megaohm below 1 kiloohm, while the base voltage increases from 0.6 to 0.7V. The values were recorded by altering the base voltage with potentiometers and by measuring the voltage drop at the base pin respectively the load resistor. The resistance of the emitter-collector line was determined indirectly via the voltage drop at the load resistor. Here you can see a simplified version of the used circuit. Once again, a battery with a nominal voltage of 12V is used as voltage source. Remember, at base voltages between 0 and 0.5V, almost no variation of the voltage drop at the load resistor can be detected. Very interesting is the range between 0.6 and 0.7V, where at the voltage drop at the load resistor increases from 0.19V up to 11.82V, which is nearly the voltage output of the battery. A voltage divider is formed by the transistor and the load resistor, hence the voltage drop between emitter and collector drops from 12.29V to 1.18V. Altering the base voltage for just 0.1V causes a variation of more than 11V at the load resistor. Signals can be amplified by using this characteristic. Now we need a signal source. I am using a loudspeaker. Normally, those devices are used in output mode. An alternating current is running through the windings of an inductor being placed inside of the magnetic field of a permanent magnet. The interaction of the magnetic fields of inductor and permanent magnet results in a force acting on a membrane. Vice versa, if the membrane is actuated, a voltage is induced at the windings of the inductor. The intention is to amplify the signal output of our source, strictly speaking the alternating fraction of the signal. To do so, we have to turn the potentiometer until the base voltage is approximately 0.6V. This is the operating point or bias point of our amplifying circuit. The voltage drop at the transistor's emitter-collector line equals those at the load resistor at the operating point. Moreover, the variable resistance of the emitter-collector line equals those of the constant load resistor. By increasing the base voltage slightly above the operating point, the voltage drop at the load resistor increases clearly because of the decreasing resistance of the transistor. On the other hand, by decreasing the base voltage slightly, the voltage drop at the load resistor is decreasing significantly because of the increasing resistance of the transistor. The alternating input signal has to be added to, respectively subtracted from the direct base voltage adjusted at the operating point. There are two ways to achieve this. We can open the circuit between potentiometer and base pin to switch the loudspeaker in series to the potentiometer. A disadvantage of this principle is the ohmic resistance of the signal source, which is added to those of the potentiometer. By replacing the signal source by another one with a different ohmic resistance, the operating point has to be readjusted. Another disadvantage is the constant current running through the windings of the inductor, even while the membrane is at rest. Let's have a look at the second way. A capacitor is added to the base pin of the transistor. The signal source is attached between the second clamp of the capacitor and ground. Now the capacitor gets charged as soon as a voltage is attached to the circuit. While the membrane of the loudspeaker is not actuated, 
the voltage drop at the capacitor matches exactly those at the base, which is the operating point. By tipping on the membrane, the voltage induced by the inductor is added to those of the capacitor. We don't need to readjust the operating point if the signal source is replaced by another one with a different ohmic resistance. But what about the capacitance of the used capacitor? The first device has a capacitance of 4.7 microfarad. Let's record the curve progression at the input clamps of our amplifying circuit and compare it to the original plot. Striking are the missing needle shaped peaks in comparison to the original plot. This is caused by the capacitance of the input circuit. Remember the capacitor switched in series to the signal source. The electric power of the signal source is low, that is why we are trying to amplify the signal and some of the power is required to charge the capacitor, which is why the peaks of the fast changing input signals are lessened by the device. The higher the capacitance of the used capacitor, the larger those unwanted effect becomes. If the capacitance becomes too low, 0.33 microfarad are used here, the amplifying circuit can't boost the input signal, or at least just slightly. An increasing base current is required to increase the base voltage. The product of voltage and current is the electric power of a circuit. Hence electric power is required to drive the amplifying circuit and those power is drawn from the capacitor. The lower the capacitance, the higher the impedance, which is the opposition that the capacitor presents to the passage of a current. Hence the lower the power transmission to the amplifier. The current gain of power transistors is approximately 10. If a high output power is required, the input signal must provide a current which is just 10 times lower than those of the output signal. If your input signal doesn't provide such a high current, you can amplify the input signal by using a small signal transistor and using the output of the first amplifying circuit as input of the second circuit with the power transistor. Instead of two entire circuits, you can use two bipolar transistors connected in such a way that the current amplified by the first transistor is amplified further by the second one. A compound structure using this principle is called Darlington transistor. The bias voltage at the operating point is approximately twice the voltage of a normal transistor, because there are two junctions between base and emitter of the Darlington transistor. Let's connect a second loudspeaker to the output clamps of our amplifying circuit and see what's happening. While tipping at the membrane of the input loudspeaker, we can't hear anything coming out of the output device. When checking the output voltage of the circuit, you will recognize that there is a clear shift of the operating point. By attaching the loudspeaker to the circuit, a second resistor is connected in parallel to the transistor. The ohmic resistance of the loudspeaker is very low, just 8 ohm. By attaching those 8 ohm resistor in parallel to the transistor, whose resistance is approximately 180 ohm, the total resistance of the two devices decreases to just 7.7 ohm. There is no way to readjust the operating point while the loudspeaker is attached in parallel to the transistor. By attaching the loudspeaker in parallel to the load resistor, whereat we can also detect an amplified output signal, the operating point can indeed be readjusted, but caution. At the operating point with the loudspeaker switched in parallel to the load resistor, the current running primarily through the loudspeaker would increase to 779 mA. The power dissipation at the loudspeaker increases to 4.7 Watt, even without processing an input signal. That could damage the output device. A simple solution to the problem is attaching a capacitor in series to the output loop. Now the direct current fraction is locked from running through the output circuit. As soon as the voltage drop at the load resistor or the transistor will rise, 
caused by an altering input signal, a current is running through the output loudspeaker. The power output of the circuit is still very low, hence just a low sound is coming out of the device. I am using some salt to visualize the movement of the membrane. Remember the maximum direct current running through the load transistor is 66mA, the accordant power output is 800mW. When replacing the load resistor by another one with a lower resistance, the power output increases. With the 100 ohm resistor we get 1.44W. The loudspeaker still doesn't speak loud. But remember, the direct current running through the output circuit at the operating point increases to 60mA with a power dissipation of 400mW, which is above the maximum power dissipation of the used resistor. When using a PNP transistor instead of a NPN device, the circuit has to be altered slightly. Now the resistance of the transistor, hence the voltage drop, is increasing with increasing positive input voltage. The load resistor is connected between ground, which is the negative terminal and collector. A push-pull amplifier consists of two transistors, one being a NPN type and one being a PNP type receiving the same input signal. Those transistor pair is typically matched in specifications, except for polarity. Matched inverted polarity devices are called complementary pairs. The circuit is connected to two independent voltage sources, e.g. two batteries with a voltage output of 12 volts. The positive terminal of the lower battery is connected to the negative terminal of the upper battery. This point is the reference potential, meaning the ground clamp. The upper NPN transistor becomes conductive if a positive voltage is applied between ground and input clamp. Now electrons can run from ground via the output loudspeaker and the NPN transistor to the positive terminal of the upper battery. The negative terminal is at the right side of the output clamps, the electrons are pushed from the right to the left through the loudspeaker. When applying a negative voltage to the input clamp, the lower PNP transistor becomes conductive, hence electrons are running from the negative terminal of the lower battery via the PNP transistor and the loudspeaker to the ground clamp. Now the positive terminal is at the right side of the output clamps, the electrons are pulled from the left to the right through the loudspeaker. Pushing respectively pulling the electrons through the output device is why this circuit is called push-pull amplifier. The circuit can be altered slightly for using the amplifier with just one voltage source. The transistor pair used here differs slightly in specification, hence the amplification of the negative half waves differs from those of the positive half waves. Without a bias voltage attached to the base pins of the transistors, crossover distortions can be detected at the output curve of push-pull amplifiers. Remember that the resistance of a transistor is almost not relying at base voltages between 0 and plus 0.6V at NPN types, respectively 0 and minus 0.6V at PNP types. Hence a variation of the input voltage between minus 0.6V and plus 0.6V causes no voltage drop at the output clamps. Attaching a bias voltage to the base pins causes another effect. The resistance of both transistors decreases, hence a higher current is running from the positive to the negative terminal through the emitter collector lines of both devices. Those current is running even without attaching a voltage to the input clamps. The measure of the ability of an amplifier to increase the power or amplitude of a signal from the input to the output is called gain. Let's have a closer look at the voltage gain of our amplifying circuit. 
At the first oscillograph we can read a peak voltage of 50mV at the input clamps and 1.6V at the output clamps. The resulting voltage gain is 32. At the second plot we can read a peak voltage of 100mV at the input clamps and 2.1V at the output clamps. The resulting voltage gain is 21. With increasing input voltage, the gain is decreasing clearly. Those non-linear amplifying is caused by the non-linear correlation between base current and base voltage, which is no straight line. By switching three of the circuits demonstrated at this video in series, we get a total circuit with a very high gain. I would like to illustrate two effects with the help of this amplifier. The output voltage of an amplifier can't exceed the voltage of the power supply. If the amplifying circuit is pushed to create a signal with a higher voltage than its maximum capability, the output signal is cut or clipped at those maximum value. The result is a sine wave becoming a distorted square wave type. The second effect is... Acoustic feedback. Strictly speaking, positive acoustic feedback. The sound coming out of the output speaker is picked up by the input speaker and amplified in an infinite loop. Ideally, an amplifier increases the power of a signal without otherwise altering it. As we could see, the input signal is always affected by the amplifying circuit. Only some of the effects were mentioned at this video. Depending on the quality of the amplifying circuit, distortions can be limited, but never wiped out completely. Random fluctuation in an electric signal is a characteristic of all electronic circuits. Those random fluctuation is called noise. Practical amplifiers have finite distortions and noise, which they invariably add to the signal. In this spirit, enjoy creating your own amplifying circuits.